Hello, I'm Jeff Boyd, and I'm here to introduce to you Dr. Lewis Little, who will talk about the theory of elementary waves and how that explains the Innsbruck experiments. But first, let me say something about the Innsbruck experiments. What are they? The story started in 1935 when Einstein and colleagues published a paper proposing a thought experiment in which a pair of photons would go in opposite directions and these photons would be twins. This became known as the EPR experiment and other people built this experiment and tried it out. Einstein thought something was missing, some hidden variables. John Bell published probability equations which would empirically show whether Einstein was right or wrong. It turns out Einstein was wrong. Subsequently, this experimental design became known as the Bell Test Experiment. In 1982, Elaine Aspect and others in Innsbruck, Austria, built the ultimate Bell Test Experiment. A pair of photons is emitted going in opposite directions, and while the photons are in flight, before they reach the polarizers at which they are detected, the polarizers are rotated at random. This Innsbruck experiment was thought to be the ultimate proof of not only quantum mechanics, but particularly the concept of entanglement or non-locality. The Innsbruck experiments proved what they set out to prove, which is that there are no hidden variables. But the Innsbruck experiments were not designed to test quantum physics versus the theory of elementary waves, a theory that was first published in 1996. Let me introduce to you now Dr. Lewis Little, who will explain how the theory of elementary waves explains the Bell test experiments, or Innsbruck experiments. Welcome, I'm, I'm Lewis Little, and I'd like to continue the discussion from the introductory uh, video about the elementary theory and discuss how it applies to the Innsbruck experiment and uh, demonstrate that, in fact, with the elementary wave theory, there is no non-locality and none of those problems that one has with quantum mechanics. Now, at Innsbruck, according to quantum mechanics, there was a, uh, a two-particle source which would emit photons in opposite directions and or, or pardon me, along opposite uh, fiber optic cables, but for representation, say, opposite directions toward polarizers. And one would observe the relative polarizations on the two sides. Now, as this experiment is conceived, it's really designed to test Einstein's idea of how to fix quantum mechanics. With the waves still going the same way and the same theory, and then seeing if there are hidden variables that would allow one to eliminate this non-locality. And the experiment, along with Bell's theorem, conclusively proves that that's impossible. If these waves do move out from the source, then one seemingly is stuck with this non-locality as the only way to account for it. Now, in the elementary wave theory, the waves are coming in from the polarizers. Waves at all the different polarizations are, are coming in. Basically, the same waves coming in that are going out in the current theory. And they interfere at the two-particle source. See, in quantum mechanics, the interference, in effect, takes place between the locations of the two polarizers. The, the pair of waves on one side interacts or, or interferes with the pair on the other side. Now, this for whatever orientation one has chosen on the two sides. And the, the interference then determines the probability of the different combinations of uh, polarizations. Uh, in the elementary wave theory, the waves come in and they interfere at the source, locally. The interference is exactly the same interference that occurs non-locally in quantum mechanics. One can convince oneself of that by just imagining that one takes 
all the waves on one side that are coming in, pardon me, going out in quantum mechanics, and transport them around over to here. So now they're still going the same way, and the other quantum waves are moving out, and they would interfere together over here. This is the Innsbruck experiment in claymation, which means clay used to make an animated cartoon. A source emits a pair of photons that go in opposite directions and are detected at polarizers. Quantum physics says these photons are also waves. They are photons at the very beginning and end, but throughout their flight they are quantum waves. According to quantum mechanics, there is interference at the two polarizers, which is called entanglement, because they are remote from one another. Quantum waves start at the center and travel out to the polarizers where the waves on the right somehow interfere with the waves on the left. Elementary waves start at the polarizers and travel to the center where the waves on the right interfere with the waves on the left. In order to convince yourself that the interference is the same in both cases, Dr. Little suggests the thought experiment shown here. Thus, although the interference is located in different places in the two theories, it is exactly the same interference. That's really exactly what's happening with the waves coming in from the two sides. So it's the very same interference. And the result then has to be the same. Um, the reason this works, the particles need only occupy a single state. Um, you have multiple waves coming in, but the particle goes out in a single state. And the same with the particle on the other side. The interference caused by elementary waves has no further effect on the photons once they are emitted, and each photon follows only one elementary wave back to the polarizer from which that particular wave originated. Uh, there's never any need to have particles in multiple states. As I showed, for example, with the double slit experiment, the particle goes through only one slit, doesn't go through both. Now, that's not to say that the particles come out in one state of polarization. We know that until a photon goes through a polarizer, it isn't polarized. It only becomes polarized at the polarizer. So it's in one state of some variables, the nature of which we at present do not know, that will determine how it acts at each polarizer. And if you want to picture this to yourself, uh, you can imagine that, that each photon as it comes out carries a, a lookup table, if you will, that will specify what you'll see for any potential orientation of a polarizer. And the key is that these tables for the two photons are written together at the source locally. Now, one thing that's been confusing both to me and to other physicists is um, the following. These particles, the photons, have to carry something that determines which way they're going to be seen. And so it sort of sounds like there still is a determination here and that Bell's term would therefore apply. But there's an equivocation involved there because, again, all the photon carries is, in effect, the lookup table. It's already determined which way it's going to be seen for any orientation there. Those variables, whatever they are, do not include the variables in the source that determine the correlations between the two sides. Those variables stay in the source. They're responsible for, if you will, simultaneously writing those tables on both sides. And their job is then done. After that, the photon simply goes the way that was already determined at the source. The same for both photons. So one understands it's the same interference, the same probabilities result, but everything is determined at the source nothing at the polarizers. Another way one might think of this is Bell's theorem is proved using probability distributions that are supposed to be smooth and continuous. There is no such thing at the polarizers in this theory. The distribution is totally discontinuous. It's either horizontal or vertical. 
And if you put the polarizer in different orientations, it switches back and forth. The only place Bell's theorem could apply would be at the source, and everything occurs locally there, so there's no non-locality. According to TEW, the theory of elementary waves, these waves are pictured as coming from the polarizers and causing interference at the source 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. When a physicist turns on the electricity so that a photon pair is emitted, those photons each follow an elementary wave back to the polarizer, but the waves are there before and after the photon's flight. So if quantum waves don't exist but elementary waves do, how can it be that quantum mechanics has correct probability equations? The probabilities work because the interference is the same whether you have a picture of what's actually going on or whether you incorrectly believe in quantum waves. There really was no problem here to begin with. If we had understood that the waves came in, well, the source responds to them and emits particles that are then observed a particular way, there never would have been any thought about any non-locality being involved. Um, after all, whatever you see at a remote polarizer is exactly what you would have seen if you looked at the moment that these photons are emitted. And of course at that moment everything is local and so whatever you'd see there is exactly what you'd see remotely. Where is the issue of any non-locality? So I submit that this theory does explain Innsbruck locally with, with no non-locality being involved. And um, to me, this is one more proof that the elementary wave theory is the correct theory and quantum mechanics is not. Uh, to my way of thinking, non-locality makes no sense at all. It's uh, uh, an effect produced by no means. A, a communication between the two sides by no means. One cannot have a communication by no means. That's something happening ghost-like. Not, it's not physics, it's, it's ghosts. And uh, there has to be a means. Something doesn't happen for no reason.